Welcome to our, our uh, celebration of World Water Day. Um, we have a wonderful group of people that are going to speak to us and speak with us. But before we get to them, I'd like to offer an acknowledgement of where we are. Um, and I always do that when I'm on Zoom. I tell people where I am, and then I ask them to make an acknowledgement on their own to where they are. Okay. So uh, we are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabek people. The Anishinaabek include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi First Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We dedicate this gathering to honoring their history and culture and are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. So having said that, I uh, want to welcome you all to Simcoe County Kairos um, it's the International Water Day celebration, and we're going to start with my student, Vicky Minay, who is going to, to, to lead us off. Go ahead, Vicky, take the floor. Oh, bojo. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to uh, start a screen share here. Um, and I always wonder if people can see the screen. <laughs> uh, so just give me a second here. Um, not the best with Zoom. Uh, all right, so everybody can see that? Perfect. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the Indigenous perspective on water. And what I have there is uh, and what that means is all of us, all of us will protect the water and look after it. And that is actually an inclusive statement that uh, it, it is that transcends um, all of the, the different ways that we dissect ourselves or that we divide our communities. Um, it transcends identity politics, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And it, it really is about um, us coming together as human beings to protect the water. I'm gonna extend a little bit um, Doug's uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I am from Bosley First Nation, which is in the, um, which is in Georgian Bay. Uh, it's about a half an hour from Penetanguishene in Midland. Um, my whole way of life since I was a child growing up on reserve is around water. Um, our community is situated around water. Uh, fishing is a big industry within our community. Uh, we are only accessible by boat and sometimes by ice road. Um, we are considered, even though we're in, we are in um, central Ontario, we are considered an isolated community. Those are my three kids there, by the way, they were much smaller and I was much smaller than two as well, but that, that's our Indian maiden and, and we are getting a new boat. So if you've ever been to Christian Island, you know, I actually suggest that everybody go to Christian Island and um, just be able to uh, attune yourself to the experience that my people go through every single day of their life um, by traveling by either ice or skidoo or hovercraft or, uh, or boat uh, during those weather conditions. Um, so Bosley First Nation is home to 750 people plus um, over, uh, over the winter months. But in the summer, we can see an inflation of that population to about 12,000, or sorry, not 12, 2,000 people um, with, our cottage, with our cottagers and uh, tourism. Um, we have signed multiple treaties with the Crown. Um, and so uh, Lake Simcoe is actually in our treaty to territory. Um, it's closest to the Williams Treaty, but also multiple pre-Confederation treaties as well. Um, the history of, uh, of the Anishinaabe people, and I am Anishinaabe in this area, is the history of the Chippewa Tri-Council, which is the people of Georgina Island, uh, Rama, and uh, Bosley First Nation. So it is really important to understand that we were once one tribe. And due to a number of different, uh, due to colonization, we were separated and put into three different bands. Um, so Barry, Aurelia and surrounding areas really is in the territory of the Chippewa Tri Council. Um, and so I like to acknowledge um, Rama and Georgina Island. Um, and I'm sorry that I, I can't speak on behalf of those committee or those communities and their water issues tonight, um, but they do definitely have their own um, challenges with respect to water that need to be addressed, especially with uh, Georgina Island and the fact that Georgina Island is directly in uh, Lake Simcoe. 
um, they do have a story to tell and I'm, 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 I'm sorry that I'm not able to speak on their behalf tonight. Um, so before I go any further, what I would like to talk about is uh, first acknowledging my first um, teacher, uh, Badwed and Bun Benesi, or Badwed and Benesi Bun, and uh, uh, Bidasage Bun. Um, so remembering Josephine Mandaman Bun and Eddie Benton Benesi Bun. Um, so a lot of people don't know um, that Eddie Benton uh, Benesi who has passed on now just recently, he was actually the motivation behind the Mother Earth Water Walks. And most, most people who are involved uh, with water in any sort of indigenous um, capacity, uh, they know of the other, the Mother Earth Water Walks. So Josephine and um, Eddie were really, really, uh, really worked together on those, um, on those Mother Earth Water Walks. And so I wanna remember Josephine Mendelman as well, who has passed on. Uh, just over a year now, I think almost two years now, um, she's been gone and, and she left a legacy for water. And um, one of the things that she uh, said was, uh, you know, she's to tell people to continue to love the water, to work from a place of love for the water. And that's what this, that's what all uh, water activism is about. It's about um, creating that sort of sense of love. So I like to acknowledge them because uh, little did I know that my water activism, and most people know me from Site 41, I was arrested, charged, slapped within a lawsuit and an injunction for Site 41. Um, and a lot of my water activism uh, relates to the work that um, Josephine and Eddie uh, had started already. Although at Site 41, I didn't know Josephine Mendelman at all. And I didn't meet her until later on. So, um, but it was really uh, being inspired by this work of understanding the spiritual relationship with water. So Dump Site 41, uh, most of you know, it's it. we're in, a, I think about our 12th year now since this happened, uh, it was in 2009, but uh, why was it successful? And that's really what I'm here to talk about tonight is why was Site 41 successful? Uh, it had been challenged for over 25 years. Uh, First Nations people came uh, sort of at the 11th hour. Um, and that was the, over here you see the five women who started the protest camp at Site 41. Um, and uh, one of the things that I found was the reason why it was successful is because it created a community. It created a community around water where everybody had this um, place. Uh, everybody had a role, everybody had a place, nobody was excluded. Um, it was really coming together and finding our commonality as human beings and being able to work for water. I mean, and, and it definitely was not without its challenges. There were a lot of different challenges with Site 41 and, and sometimes interpersonal challenges, which if you're a water activist, you probably know what I'm talking about because you don't do activists without having those kinds of activism, without having those kinds of challenges. And, um, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but that was really the, the some of the core attributes to why that movement, um, why Dump Site 41 was stopped. And so it re actually re heavily relied upon um, this sort of uh, intersection of science and spirit and faith and hope um, that was born from that intersection. And so with respect to that as well, um, we also kind of married uh, traditional knowledge with Western knowledge. And so that's a, that's a lot of what you won't see in, in the things that have been published about Site 41. You don't see a lot of that. You see, uh, but it, that really needs to be brought into the dialogue about Site 41 because th those are ultimately the keys to why it was successful in the first place. Um, and I really think that, you know, the more that we look at Dump Site 41, it actually creates a model for water activism, for um, protecting watersheds um, in any area that you are. One of the things that Indigenous people brought to the Site 41 movement wasn't just the traditional knowledge, but it was also um, the treaty rights. And so when I was in court, um, defending myself against a lawsuit, it was basically on treaty rights and the 
um, duty to consult and accommodate in how we actually were able to resolve that lawsuit. Um, and so Indigenous people have a lot to um, contribute to water movements and they are actively, I, I actually don't know an Indigenous person who doesn't, um, who is not involved in some way, shape or form with water. I mean, it, and it, whether it's, you know, like even something as simple as, as educating their family or trying to reduce uh, their water consumption or even trying to get clean drinking water for their community, which is another issue that we're not going to talk about tonight, but it is a very serious one. Um, and we know, uh, we know right now that First Nations people continue to go without clean drinking water and a lot of them are in Ontario. Um, so that's a that's a major, major consideration, but I don't know any in, Indigenous people that are not somehow involved with with protecting water in some way, shape or form, or at least having some level of water consciousness. And so um, the part, the harder part of all of this is getting the um, is getting the poli politics on board with that. And so what we saw at Site 41 where there were really, really heavy, intensive lobbying campaigns. And the interesting thing about it was that um, what came out of Site 41 by the time August 25th, 2009 happened was that people actually, um, even though they did wear their party hats, whether they were the Green Party or the Conservatives or the Liberals, everybody kind of still wore their, their party hats, but was able to come together beyond um, the realm of party politics. And that's one of the things that we need to continue to capitalize on for water activism and protecting watersheds. We have to be able to build that dialogue um, that is furthering and advancing these causes beyond party politics. Um, so what is the indigenous perspective on water? And I'm only gonna tell you one thing, water is life. If, if we're not doing this for life, then why are we doing it at all? Um, the Indigenous worldview is heavily entrenched into, um, into how, we, how we relate with other beings on the earth and whether it's water, whether it's fire, whether it's a tree, whether it's um, an animal, whether it's a plant, it, it really doesn't matter. It is all life. And so the central premise, not just for Anishinaabe people, but for even people that I, uh, for even indigenous people, indigenous worldviews that I've studied abroad, their central premise also is life and the protection and the extension of life in, into the future. Um, and so the worldview around water is about protecting life. And so, and you see, you see this, you can Google this online and people see it all the time and, but we don't really understand what it means, right? What does it mean water is life? What does it mean water is life? It means about being conscious enough to understand that when you take an action or do any sort of action in your life, that there is a water uh, cost to that. And so um, what we need to do now is actually be looking at and understanding, um, I guess, this idea of water footprint, but also it is relational and accountable. And so, and I guess in that way, in understanding the, the water footprint is understanding our own accountability to water. There are reciprocal relationships that take place. I give to the water and the water gives to me. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but we understand um, that as Indigenous people, every step that we take, we affect future generations. And every step that we take is because of the generations um, before us. And we affect all of life around us in this present moment. And so that is a very, very uh, important um important way to look at water, but not just water, but about life. And I think what it relates most to this kind of understanding is, is a agrarianism. If you look at how um, that very, very earth-based mentality is, is entrenched in that, it's almost this, I wouldn't say it's the same, but there are some similarities there um, that we can look at. So this was the quarry water walk in 2017. Um, this was really about what's happening with um, 
Uh, what's happening with the expansion permits up on French's Hill, I don't know if any of you know about that, but um, there is, uh, they're really trying to make a mega quarry here and it's just up the road from site 41, like less than two kilometers. So what we did was we did this water walk. Uh, we actually did two water walks actually, this is the first one. Um, and what you see here is you see is a, is a community of people who've come together to protect the water. Um, that this issue is still ongoing. Um, the Alliston Aquifer is at threat right now. That's a major, major issue that needs to be looked at. Um, with respect to um, the aquifer itself, you know, Dr. Bill Shoddick, and I don't know if any of you know, but Dr. Bill Shoddick and um, Dr. Sherry are actually working on hydrogeological studies right now, testing the purity of this water because the samples from the Alliston Aquifer, which actually goes towards Lake, uh, Lake Simcoe, have been tested by Dr. Bill Shoddick against um, the cleanest layers of Arctic glacial ice that are six to 8,000 years old. And so this aquifer really, really is worth protecting. Um, the fact that the, the underground filtration system can take, it takes 25 years for the water to get from the sky to the, to the deepest levels of the aquifer. And by the time it gets to the aquifer, it's pure. Um, and so I drink it at home. I actually go to the flow in Elmville. I just went there yesterday actually. Um, and we go through about 30 gallons of water. Um, and it's kind of getting hard on my back to lift all that water, but you know, I'm hoping my sons are gonna pitch in at some time and help me carry that water. Um, but uh, we, we go there and we, we drink this water at home. And actually, once you start drinking the water from the aquifer, you actually cannot go back to drinking um, tap water. There, you notice the significant changes in, in just how you're drinking it. So I'm hoping to do a study on the water um, this summer if I can to see how people are using that flow um, in Elmville to uh, how many times they're using it and what, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, um, benefits it provides to the broader community, um, especially with respect to what's happening in the threats that are on it. So the quarry is only one threat, but there are multiple different threats to the water. So we need to also consider that. Uh, we also need to consider that Lake, Lake Simcoe, the, Alliston Aquifer and Lake Huron, they're all interconnected. And so what happens to one in Georgian Bay, for instance, will happen to the other. Once, once water gets contaminated in one area, it goes through the whole entire hydrogeological system. So that is something that we also need to consider. And um, especially like for Bosley First Nation, you know, like our water comes from Georgian Bay, our drinking water comes from Georgian Bay. And we're lucky that we have a water treatment facility, but we just got that in the early 90s. And so um, I, I still wonder whether or not a lot of the health problems that we're seeing uh, in our population is due to the fact that we didn't have no water treatment facility until the early and mid 90s. So that's something else to consider. Uh, water miracles. So I call this water miracles and um, since Site 41, I've been heavily involved with uh, water activism locally uh, and abroad internationally. Um, and what I've done is actually used water to connect with um, other Indigenous people across the world. And really, it was about creating solidarity with Indigenous people who are struggling for water around the world. Um, and uh, so in the first picture, what you see is the Khoisan and this, I want to actually mention Jillian von Longsdorf and her daughter, um, who actually traveled to uh, South Africa and took the Site 41 water from here uh, over there. And what you're seeing there is a ceremony that is being done by the Khoisan um, with the water that we sent. And the interesting thing about this was it the, the day that uh, when this actually, when the water actually went to South Africa, Cape Town was actually, um, was actually experiencing a drought. And it was so bad that the municipal taps were going to be shut off in Cape Town. 
And what we did over here was we gathered the women, we did a, we did a ceremony for the water and then we sent it on its way. And, you know, you're kind of worried about, you know, how do you get this water from Canada to another country? You know, is it going to go through customs? All of these different things, right? These logistical things that uh, barriers that you're thinking about, but literally we had no problem and it, and it made it. But the thing was, as soon as the plane touched the ground at, uh, in Cape Town, it started to rain. And it actually rained so much that there that they didn't need to turn off the the taps anymore. So that was a huge um, a huge uh, a huge um, affirmation that what we were doing was good work and building that solidarity amongst each other is good work and that we needed to, to, to continue that. It by no means means that the struggles for the Khoisan are finished or, or complete. Um, they actually walked uh, with the water twice and we sent the water there twice already. Um, but, you know, I continue to think about them. So the other picture there is me in Honduras in 2019. And um, I actually met with the Lenka and I wanted to actually put up a picture of Berta Caceres here because Berta Caceres was murdered for the work as an environmental activist in Honduras. And I actually went to her house and um, I met her, her daughter and I went to her organization, Coquine. And I didn't put the pictures here, but I don't know if any of you remember, but there was a water walk in 2019 organized by Amy Grenier through the Simcoe County District School Board. And that water walk actually had over 900 students participate. And we were so lucky that uh, we got to put the Site 41 water in that water walk and it was carried by Bosley First Nation uh, youth. Um, actually, it was carried by uh, Bosley First Nation youth, her mother and her grandmother. And, uh, and it wasn't my family, it was, some, it was another family, but we we're so proud of, of, of them for doing that. And so when you're walking with the water, you're energizing the water, you're praying with the water. And I think there's there, I don't, I, I think his name is Mashimoto. He did studies on this water, right? And, and he showed that, um, oh, if you send the water love, it reacts, right? And he's basically showing that water is alive. And I'm not sure if I got the name wrong, so please <laughs> forgive me for that. But when, uh, when we do uh, water ceremonies, which I'm not going to share um, because we don't put our ceremonies online. And, and so I can't, I can't talk about that. But, um, but when we do water ceremonies, you know, these are ceremonies that are filling that water up with love. And so that is the same idea. And then it was just affirmed by science. <laughs> That's how Anishinaabe people look at. We've been doing this for thousands of years. And now science is confirming that this, that this is what's happened. So when, we were, when, uh, when I was in Honduras and I was carrying this little jar of water with me everywhere that I went and um, Oh, we were going up into the mountain and we were going into the Lanka community. So this is actually the Lanka community and they were actually fighting a hydro dam. And what happened was um, they were actually being criminalized and murdered for protecting the water. Their whole community was being criminalized and murdered by the Honduran government. And, um, and I, I witnessed uh, firsthand some of the criminalization activities that were happening there when I was there um, because you could smell tear gas um, you could hear firing. Uh, so there's a lot of civil unrest there. But with the Lanka community, their whole livelihood is about the water. They're right next to a river, and that river is what sustains their community. And so um, when I was there, this is the oldest grandmother in that community, and her name was Maria. And she was so happy to come forward. But one of the things was that uh, when she came forward to accept the water, it started to move and it was in my hand and it started like the whole jar just started shaking. And I was like, wow, what's going on here. Right. Um, and so what they did was they, um, they were so happy to have somebody acknowledge and validate their struggles. Oh, yeah. um, some, something that they were going through. And that really is that miracle of solidarity and respect and support for them allows them to help to continue to do what they're doing today. So it by no means ended the hydroelectric dam that is going up uh, that is going to threaten their livelihood, but it definitely was something that gave them hope.
Um, and so what they did with that water was they took it to where that dam is and they put it in there and they gathered all of the women of their community to go and do that. So um, in this way, this was how us as Anishinaabe people over here can continue to support the work of Berta Caceres in Honduras. And so the water has gone all over the place. We've sent it to uh, New Zealand. We've sent it to um, Mauna Kai in Hawaii. Um, and we sent it to Nepal. It's gone to China. It's gone to Japan. Um, there's more pictures that can be shown here of the different places it's gone. And I'm just telling a little bit of the story. Um, but it's gone to Indigenous people everywhere who are struggling and standing up for water. Um, the other thing is type E botulism. I'm gonna, I hope I'm not... Doug, you can tell, cut me off whenever you need to. Okay. So we did a water walk in, in, in uh, 2015, or actually it was 2013. And what happened in Georgian Bay, and I'm not sure if any of you remember this, was the outbreak of type E botulism that was killing the birds, the fish, the dogs, deer were washing up dead. Um, so it was an outbreak in Georgian Bay. And so what we did was we uh, did a water walk and we walked around um, 787 kilometers around Georgia Bay. And it really was about creating a movement of unity and trust and respect. It was about connecting Anishinaabe people with other Anishinaabe people who also depend on Georgia Bay for life. So when the type E botulism um, happened, it really adversely affected our communities. Most of our communities are fishing communities. Um, most of our dogs are showing up dead. It really got into the whole uh, ecosystem. And so what happened was then we walked and it took about 17 days, but we walked and, and we completed that water walk. And these are some of the pictures here. A lot of different people took part. We didn't discriminate against anybody. We wanted to make sure that even if you were not an Anishinaabe, that you had the ability to walk with us. And we were so grateful for the support that we got, especially through the uh, United Church. Uh, who put up the water walkers wherever we went. Um, actually, I think they also made uh, donations, but there were so many people who supported the water walk all, all throughout the municipalities and First Nations that we went through. Um, and so what happened after that water walk was that um, it, it actually the bay froze over. So what happened on Christian Island was we never actually had um, we didn't have ice and ice is something that we rely on in the winter time to be able to travel on and off reserve and we didn't we hadn't had ice in something like four or five years but that winter it froze so much that there was about five to six feet of ice um between georgia uh, between christian island and cedar point and we were actually operating on there like highway 400 and then the next spring there was no more type e botulism so i mean you can you can question what i'm saying you know, you can you can say, oh, well, it's just coincidence or whatever. But for us, when we're walking with these with these um, with the water and when we're walking with eagle staffs and we have faith in the spirit and faith in the creator, then we know that our prayers are going to be answered. So that is a huge part of it. Um, so my last slide here is so about protecting watersheds. If there's anything that I want you to take. Um, away from tonight, it's that we have to work together collaboratively. That includes Indigenous people, um, that should say Western, that should be um, the intersection of Western philosophies and Indigenous knowledge and science and spirit. Um, and then what that does is actually, it, it, it broadens your audience because you're giving somebody, you're giving everybody something that they can relate to. And if it's just Western science alone, you aren't going to get the same uh, response. If it's just spirit alone, you won't get the same response because we have so many different ways that we that we express ourselves and, and through our beliefs and our cultures and what have you. Um, learning about Indigenous territories and rights. So this is something that I really, really critically, critically uh, request of everybody um, to know the territory that you're on, but also to know the treaties that you're on, um, but also how to um, work with Indigenous people through activism. And I know there's a lot of different places that uh, do courses on, on, under, on just sort of creating understanding around, around working with Indigenous groups. Um, because there are some things I'll take, for example, one, ex one example that I had was I was to appear at an OMB hearing um, without the support of my community. And I went to this OMB hearing and uh, it was about a, a quarry and 
I found that correspondence was written on behalf of my First Nation that my First Nation never sanctioned. And they asked me to come and I thought I was just coming to support. And then the next thing you know, I was there as a witness and um, a participant. And so I had to actually leave and call my chief and tell my chief and we had to get our legal team involved. So we want to be able to avoid situations like that where indigenous rights are being um, inappropriately used um, without our knowledge or consent. Um, so that's an important part, uh, creating a community where everybody has a role in a place, but also the last one is the most important one is fundamentally shifting how we use water. Understanding that there's a water footprint, a human rights footprint and a carbon footprint of every single thing that we use. And so the more that we can uh, return to our mother, the earth to, to provide for us, um, the better off I think our communities are going to be and the more sustainable we're going to be. So I just want to leave it at that and I'll be around uh, for this whole presentation to take questions, but I want to thank you all very much for your time and for your support. Aha, miigwech. Thank you very much, Vicki. Um, there was one question that came. So uh, if you have a question for the speakers, please put it on the chat and I'll ask it when at the end of the session that the speaker has. So there was one question um, about whether or not there are still um, prayer ceremonies at SIP 41. Is that still going on now? Well, you know, I go there by myself, actually probably once every couple of weeks and um, there's big no trespassing signs there now. So, um, so I, I actually can't go onto the site anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of sad about that because I was literally arrested, charged and slapped with a lawsuit and an injunction. And now I can't go there and pray anymore. But, you know, I guess uh, that's, a, that's a little unfortunate. But we do actually have ceremonies. Um, I, we did a couple of them at the quarry. Um, the, the water walk did stop there where the sign is that says shoulder to shoulder. Um, so, I mean, we do, we still go by there all the time, but we don't, we can't have the ceremonies unless, um, we get proper permissions and what have you. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing Vicki. That was wonderful. As always, your insight and your perspective on the world is so welcoming and, and open. It's very nice. And I've, since I've known you, you've, we've just deepened and deepened our relationship through you teaching me so much about the world. So thank you again for that. Um, we're going to switch now to our second speaker, uh, George Moore. Um, turns out he's not related to me at all, even though my uncle's name was George Moore. But I guess there's a lot of Moors, just like there's a lot of Wests. Uh, in any case, George has been my uh, co-conspirator in putting all this together. Those of you other speakers know George from his emails back and forth asking you for things. But he also is on our panel because he is a, he's a reverend. He's going to talk about a, the, the Christian perspective on water. So George, over to you. Thank you very much and a good evening. And I'm speaking to you from uh, Treaty 16 territory. And um, Vicki uh, said that she was offering uh, an indigenous perspective on water. And all I can really do is offer one person's perspective on water that has been shaped by uh, my life in the, uh, in the church. Um, I want to share that I was raised in the boreal forest of Northern Ontario a land of lakes and rivers and swamps and bogs and marshes and beaver dams. Water was everywhere. And I grew up with a very deep sense of its presence all around me. My Celtic ancestors, whether Christian or pagan, held great reverence for water, indeed a reverence for all of the natural world. And um, visiting Ireland uh, back in the 90s, I came across a sacred well. So there were sacred wells and springs that helped to uh, connect uh, my ancestors to the, to the sacred world. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, water is a powerful symbol. From the waters of creation, the natural world is created. The world becomes corrupted by sinful humanity and a great flood comes to cleanse the world. Through the waters of the Red Sea, the Hebrew people pass on to liberation from slavery. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus is baptized as he prepares to begin his ministry. And Jesus offers living water to a Samaritan woman, someone seen as unclean 
and outside of Jesus' Jewish religion. Common to all of these stories is the motif of new beginnings. From the waters of creation, the universe comes into being. Waters of renewal cleanse the earth so it can begin a new age. Waters of liberation mark the beginning of new life of freedom for the Hebrew people. Waters of baptism are part of the preparation of Jesus for the ministry he is about to begin. And the living water that Jesus offers the woman of Samaria is water of inclusion that allows her to experience that she is not outside of God's love and acceptance. Water has meaning. And all the waters in these stories, to my mind, have to be clean water, pure water, because it's only pristine water, in my mind, that can lead to new life. Polluted water cannot herald new life. In the biblical stories, God repeatedly offers the water that's necessary for life, the water of life. Canada is blessed with lots of water. We have the second most abundant renewable water sources in the world. We have more lakes than the rest of the world combined. But many people in Canada don't realize how radical this gift is. We have so much water that many of us take it for granted. Many believe that there will always be access to clean water. But we've learned that nothing is without limit. There was a limit to the bison, the passenger pigeon, and the cod. This necessity of life, life has limits, and it must remain clean if it is able to sustain life. While there are a lot of references in the Bible to water, there's very little about protecting water. I was left scratching my head thinking, where in, in my background, being raised in the church and studying theology, did I ever come across anything that talked about the sacredness of water and the need to protect water? In the topical index of the concordance for the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, there is, a there is a list of the uses of water. It's used for washing and ritual cleaning and drinking. It lists passages about God and water and water as a symbol. But the concordance does not mention the protection of water. Protection of water is there in the Bible. We'll get to it in just a, a few minutes. But it's not listed. And I guess that says a lot about the people that created the concordance and its topical list than it says about the ancient biblical uh, writers. I believe the protection of water provides a corrective to the passage in Genesis that says that humanity is to have dominion over the earth. I wish it read that we were supposed to have stewardship over the earth, but that's not the way it's generally translated. However, in the writing of the prophet Ezekiel, we have, a, we have clear instructions to take care of the water and the earth. From the New Revised Standard Version, when you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? And from the contemporary English version, some of you eat the greenest grass and trample down what is left when you finish. Others drink clean water and then step in the water to make the rest of it muddy. That means my other sheep have nothing fit to drink. Ezekiel's not talking about sheep. Ezekiel's talking about the people of Israel. And reading this passage over 2,000 years later, we know that this passage also means all people. It means all animals, and it means the plants upon which we depend. It's about the oneness of all that is. But we know that what is not good for healthy or healthy for humans cannot be good or healthy for other than human beings. All rely on an adequate supply of fresh, clean water. We also know that supplies of fresh, clean water are an essential part of ecosystems that provide our food, ecosystems that provide shelter, places of rest and refreshment. Water is essential, precious, vital to living beings. The Bible uses the image of water to help us understand how much we need our God, 
Psalm 52 says, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. Our relationship with God is essential, precious, and vital to us. Many people of faith regularly give credit to God for those things that are so wonderful, so mysterious, and so out of the ordinary that they could never have come from human imagining. Love, courage, integrity, altruism, self-giving love known as agape, these are gifts of God claimed as such by people of faith. For people of faith, water is a gift from God, a gift so wondrous so precious. And we have to ask, for this kind of gift, where can we offer our thanks? Where can we show our gratitude? This is a gift so essential that we can't live without it any more than a person of faith can live a full life without their relationship with God. Even before we ask God to bless water we are about to use, it's already sacred. It speaks to us about God's abundance about God's complex world of relationships, of balance, of interdependence and interconnectedness, and maybe most of all, God's world of mystery. Water has meaning. Water has teaching. Unpacking our sacred texts using new lenses of ecological awareness help us to arrive at new understandings of what the texts can teach us. And that's most certainly a gift of God. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. That was beautiful and uh, well said. And, and I really uh, appreciate working with you on this day and on the other days we've been meeting. And I, uh, I must say that you have enlightened me um, uh, to how how the world comes together, regardless of of text, it is about experience, and I think your own experiences really speak volumes to what we've been talking about in terms of of water. And I think all of us have that same kind of feeling of of water being such a presence in our lives. It's I mean we're made of water. We're mm -hmm. our entire being is water. I think and undergirding weird. all of this that I said is that simple little sentence that Vicky offered, water is life. Yeah. That's it. It's very simple. Yet we make it so complex sometimes, so over complex in some ways. No, no offense to our next speakers. Uh, but we're going to hear from scientists now and from people who are protecting the water on a, da a daily basis. So it's important that we start with a, a traditional Anishinaabe perspective and then move to a Christian perspective because it's important that we're all not, we're a live, we live in a very diverse society. That includes those people who dedicate their lives to science. And so with that, I'm going to ask, I hope I don't pronounce your, mispronounce your name. It's, is it Gin or Jin, Brian? I just did. Gin, yeah. It's Gin. Okay. So Dr. Brian Gin is a limnologist. And limnologist is someone who cares a lot about the water, right? I mean, but, and you spent years becoming a doctor. I know I'm a doctor too, but a different kind of doctor, a doctor of philosophy, but it's, I know how long it takes to get a doctor. It's very, very hard to do. Um, and so you, you work with uh, the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, which is a marvelous organization that is constantly looking out for the well-being of the lake and and the watershed that the lake is around. And I think Vicky said it well that all the water around us is, is connected together. It's not this didn't all happen by accident. So so Brian, I'll give you the floor now. And if anyone has questions of for George or or, or Brian, I'll I'll accept them in the, the chat. So please go ahead, Brian. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, see if I do this right. Hopefully that's sharing, and there we go. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, they said, uh, um, the uh, limnologist was just a fancy word for uh, lake scientists with Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. And what I'll be speaking about today is some of the 
health of Lake Simcoe and some of the environmental and ecological trends we're seeing um, over the years since I've been with the authority since 2008. Uh, so traditionally, uh, scientific monitoring on Lake Simcoe was under the jurisdiction of two provincial ministries. Uh, Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks uh, looks after off offshore water quality and they have since the 1980s. Uh, so offshore water quality look after algae, the plankton and pollution complaints, that sort of thing. And also Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry looks after everything fish related and they've been monitoring those since the 1950s. Uh, this left a data gap in the lake monitoring, uh, something called the near shore zone or the shallow water zone. Basically the part of Lake Simcoe that's shallower than 20 meters water depth, which makes up about two thirds of the lake area. And uh, that's really what our role at the Conservation Authority is. We look at the shallow water zone and we also address the concerns of residents, uh, what they're seeing, what their thoughts are. And we investigate new and emerging issues. So things like aquatic plants on the lake, um, which are a large concern of the residents, um, invasive species, climate change, and also the water quality of the shallow water habitat. Uh, so three key environmental stressors to Lake Simcoe that are impacting the lake, and these are the three main ones, there are many others, and these are ones that are kind of widespread across the entire Great Lakes region. So the first of these is phosphorus, which is a nutrient that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, when it gets into the water, um, it's the concentration, how much of it is getting into the water, how much of it is in the water. Also, it causes algae and plant growth and that sort of thing and can deteriorate water quality. Invasive species is the second one. Uh, zebra mussels, quagga mussels are probably the two most famous or infamous ones. There's also invasive aquatic plants and also the impact of native biological communities in the lake. And the third uh, ma major one is climate change, which is a global issue, but it's also affecting us here at the local level as well. So increasing water temperatures during the summertime. There's been a decrease by about a month in uh, ice cover on Lake Simcoe uh, relative to the 1850s. And it also changes precipitation patterns. Now these three stressors don't act independently of each other. There's interaction between them. For example, climate change and warmer waters makes it easier for species to survive. Changing precipitation patterns change how water is delivered to the lake and phosphorus is delivered to the lake and how it's cycled in the lake. And also some invasive species can even change the cycling of nutrients in the lake, which is what has happened with zebra mussels and also quagga mussels. So the current lake management plan that we have is the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, which came into effect in June, 2009. And from my aspect of it, from a lake base perspective, um, my part of the plan is based on the health and sustainability of the cold water fishery. So cold water fish are things like lake trout, lake whitefish, and the herring. And they're called cold water fish because when the lake warms up in the summertime, they tend to hang out in the deep water where it's cooler and they can't really tolerate warm water. So they hang out in the deep part of the, of the lake in Kempenfelt Bay, for example. And unfortunately, this is the part of the lake that tends to run out of oxygen. Algae and plants, when they decompose, they sink to the bottom of the lake. And this consumes up oxygen and this leaves uh, not, not, not enough oxygen for the fish to survive. So in late summer and early fall, the lake can run out of oxygen. So for a healthy and sustainable cold water fishery, we need to dissolve the oxygen concentration in the water of around seven milligrams per liter at the end of the summer. And because oxygen is related to algae and plants, which is related to phosphorus, when you back calculate this through, this is where this 44 tons of phosphorus per year loading objective uh, comes from. So under the, under the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, we're trying to limit phosphorus to about 44 tons going into the lake per year. So what is phosphorus and why do we care so much about it? It's a limiting nutrient. And if you're a gardener, you know, you can add phosphorus to your garden to make your flowers and your vegetables grow. If you add it to your lawn, it can make your lawn green. But when it gets into water, the same thing that makes your lawn green can turn your lake or your river green, it's shown in this bottom picture here from Lake Erie. And that's an algal plume that is that happens frequently down there. So when too much phosphorus goes into a lake, it causes a problem called eutrophication, which is just a fancy word for nutrient enrichment. It causes excessive plant and algae growth. And then when these things die and decompose, this is where this reduced oxygen comes from. And that's why phosphorus is so integral to the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. 
So this diagram here just shows the major components of the phosphorus load. And Lake Simcoe is a little unique in that most lakes, they model how much phosphorus is coming in. At Lake Simcoe, we go out and we actually measure how much phosphorus is going in. So measure, measuring it is a lot more accurate than running it through a mathematical model and trying to figure out what's going on. So we have teams that go out and they measure how much phosphorus we're finding in the tributaries and the rivers. And this captures things like runoff from urban areas, runoff from natural areas, so forests and wetlands, runoff from the ag agricultural areas and polders such as the Holland Marsh, sewage treatment plants, septic systems, and even phosphorus that's attached to dust and rainfall in the atmosphere that falls into the lake. We record and we measure all these things and we use this to calculate the phosphorus load for Lake Simcoe. And it's an interesting fact that each year we collect more than 3 million data points that are used to calculate how much phosphorus is going into Lake Simcoe. So it's a very accurate way of try trying to find out how much of this nutrient is going into the lake. So this graph just shows the phosphorus loads going into Lake Simcoe from year 2000 up to 2017. Uh, this is a hydrologic year, and a, hy a hydrologic year, year is a little bit different from a calendar year in that it starts in June and goes through to the following May. So for example, 2017 at the end of the graph, that captures from June 2017 through to May 2018. The height of the bars are the total phosphorus load in tons per year, so that's the height of those bars. And the different colors on the bars show the different sources of phosphorus which are going in. So the tributaries, which is that land runoff from urban areas, agricultural, natural areas, and so on, that's the green color. Also sewage treatment plants in red and atmospheric and blue, for example. The black line across the middle, that is the 44 ton loading objective. And you can see the bars are higher than that. But also in the background, there's that kind of icy blue color that almost looks like a mountain range. That is the volume of water which is coming in from the tributaries. So the amount of water from the rivers which are forcing into Lake Simcoe. And you can see the years with the highest bars, for example, 2008, 2013, and 2017. Those are also the year with the highest flow volume going to the lake. And it's these high tributary flows which are accounting for high loads. So there's some variability over the past 18 years going on in this, in the amount of phosphorus which is being delivered to Lake Simcoe. And we don't just measure the amount of phosphorus which is going into the lake, we also measure the amount of phosphorus that's actually inside the lake water. So we go out, we collect lake samples, and we have these tested for phosphorus. So this graph on the bottom here now just shows the spring in lake phosphorus concentration in micrograms per liter from 1980 through to 2018. And you can see the overall trend is an improving one, it's going down, that's good. And over the last five years or so of this graph, the average is around 7.3 micrograms per liter. The provincial water quality objective for good water is anything less than 10 micrograms per liter. So we're actually meeting that in the lake. On the flip side of that is the dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen has also shown an improving trend. So this is the concentration of dissolved oxygen at the bottom of Lake Simcoe at the end of summer from 1980 through to 2018. And over the last five years, the average is around 6.2 milligrams per liter. Now, if you remember at the start, I said there our, our Lake Simcoe production plan target was seven milligrams per liter. We're getting very close to that. We've actually passed it on two occasions, but we're well above five and five milligrams per liter is the minimum amount required for cold water fish, but we want seven milligrams per liter to make sure they're happy and they're healthy at the bottom. So an interesting thing about Lake Simcoe is despite this variability in the phosphorus loading, so that bar graph at the top, the loads are going up and down, but the overall trend in Lake Phosphorus is improving and the, and the trend in, in dissolved oxygen is also improving. So now when you're in school taking courses in limnology or lake science, one thing that they hammer into you is that if you increase phosphorus loading going into a lake, you're gonna increase the nutrients in the lake and that winds up with lower oxygen. But Lake Simcoe seems to be defying this basic trend. So in theory for that 2017-18 year, if we had a phosphorus loading of 131 tons, this should result in a lake water concentration of 13 to 18, and then oxygen should be very low at the end of summer. But what happened in Lake Simcoe is that phosphorus concentration stayed in the average where it was over the past few years, and oxygen also stayed quite, quite, quite good is what we wanted. So moving forward for the next few years, we need to figure out why is Lake Simcoe kind of this rogue or this renegade lake that seems to be going in its own direction and it seems to be defying this well thought out ecological theory that exists. So for the next few years, we're, we'll be undertaking some studies to try and explain what's going on and what this means to our lake management plans. We've got three basic areas that we're gonna be looking at. 
first of these is climate change and also hydrology. So how the water is getting into the lake, uh, biological changes. So what's going on with, the, with what's living in the lake and also the role that invasive species may be having. And I'm gonna talk about numbers one and three tonight moving forward. So the first of these is climate and hydrology. That year that we had that high load with the 131 tons, that was not what we call a hydrologically normal year. Now a normal year means that we have a wet spring, the snow melts, it runs off, we have a dry summer, then we get some rain in the fall, and then we have a cold, wet winter. 2017-18 did not follow this pattern. We had kind of a dry spring followed by a wet summer, and then we also had a dry fall with a wet winter as well. And 70 to 80% of that 131 tons came from the tributaries and these polders that was washed into the lake. So two examples of this and what really drove up these loads were two months in this year, June and February. So the two pictures that I show here, these were taken at that ghost canal in Newmarket, just off uh, Bayview Parkway. Uh, the top picture shows what this, what this part of the Holland River looks like on an average day during June. What, it, what had happened was during June, 2017, we had 60 mil millimeters of rain over five days, which saturated the ground. Then on June 23rd at night, we had a, a very heavy rainstorm, which delivered another 60 millimeters of rain on this kind of saturated ground. So when rain falls on saturated ground, the ground's holding as much water as it can. There's more, no more space for it and it runs off directly into the rivers and also the streams. So this bottom picture was taken on the morning of June 24th. And you can see all that water that was dumped in from the night before running up, 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 across that canal and also flooding into the background. So this one storm accounted for 11% of the total phosphorus loading to the lake for that year. And in fact, we got almost 13 tons of phosphorus in just two days and a quarter of the load occurred during this one month. Likewise, in February, in February, we got a lot of precipitation in the form of rain instead of snow, which is what we wanted, snow, not rain. Rain on frozen ground is the same as the entire watershed is one big paved parking lot and it runs directly off into the rivers and also the streams. So 15% of that entire load occurred in February just because it was a wet month with a lot of rainstorms. And 40% of that 131 tons around 52 tons for the entire year occurred in just these two months. So that's well above our phosphorus loading objective. And it's these extreme events driven by climate change that are driving up our phosphorus loads to the lake. Another area which we're looking at are the invasive mussels. And there's two species in the lake, zebra mussels, which most people are familiar with, or quagga mussels, which are shown in this picture here on the right. Mussels are filter feeders, which means they remove particles uh, from the water. And these particles often have phosphorus. And there's so many mussels and they filter so much, each mussel can filter about a gallon of water a day. When you calculate that out by the mussel population in Lake Simcoe, they can filter a volume equivalent to the lake in a little under three days. And a recent study that was published uh, just last week, actually, that came out, showed that these quagga mussels are now the dominant controllers of phosphorus in the lower Great Lakes. So Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario, the phosphorus, where it's going and how it's being circulated around the lake is being controlled by this one invasive species. Removing all this uh, particulate matter from the water results in an increase in water clarity and, and more clear waters result in more aquatic plants. However, they're not just removing particulate phosphorus, they're also leaking dissolved phosphorus back out into the water. And that has implications for more aquatic plants as well. So we've done two studies on invasive mussels in Lake Simcoe. 2009, we went out, we sampled over 700 sites on the lake. We found out what mussels were present, which ones were there and where they were found. So these two maps just show the results of these two studies. So the blue color on the left show where zebra mussels were found and the darker the blue color means that there's a higher population or a higher amount of zebra mussels in that area. And the map on the, on the right with that kind of corally pink color shows where quagga mussels, the second species were found. So you can see that they form almost a ring in the shallow water around the lake. And that's just because there's a change in the type of bottom substrate in Lake Simcoe from kind of rock and sand to kind of this fine silt. Zebra mussels can't tolerate fine silt as filter feeders. It tends to smother you out. And that's why there were none found below about 20 meters late, uh, of depth. When we went back and redid this study in 2015, there was a complete change in the population of these mussels. Zebra mussels were greatly reduced. And even today, if you go out on Lake Simcoe, you'd be hard pressed to find one zebra mussel unless you know where to look. All the mussels that we're seeing now are these quagga mussels, these second species. Why this is, this is significant is because I've often referred to as quagga mussels as version 2.0 of zebra mussels. They're bigger, they filter faster, 
They can tolerate colder water compared to zebra mussels. They're active year round in the lake and they can survive on this silt and sediment at the bottom of the lake. So they're, they're not limited by this 20 meter depth. They go straight to the bottom of the lake. And this has challenges to the lake and also to our lake management plan and how phosphorus is being cycled. So as I said, with that mussel filtering going on, it's increased aquatic plants. And we've done three lake-wide studies on aquatic plants in Lake Simcoe, 2008, 2013, 2018. So again, these maps uh, with the green color on these maps showing where plants were found in Lake Simcoe, the darker the green color means the higher concentration of plants. The amount of aquatic plants in the lake has increased fivefold since 2008. And this increase, as you can see, the, there's a lot more dark green color in that map on the far right than there is at the map on the far left. This increase is mostly related to one invasive species. And as one invasive species, it now makes up about two thirds of all the aquatic plants that we're finding in Lake Simcoe. And this invasive plant species is starry stonewort. And this is where the devil is really in the details is that it's not technically a plant, it's a macroalgae. If you think of macroalgae like seaweed or something that you see on the, on the ocean seashore, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, macroalgae don't have roots, so they have kind of a hold fast where they can kind of weakly hold themselves in one place. Aquatic plants take all their nutrients from the underlying sediment, the same thing as trees and grasses and so on do. Macroalgae take all their nutrients from the surrounding water. And that type of nutrient that they're taking up is dissolved phosphorus. And that's the type of nutrient that was being um, uh, released from these quagga mussels. So the picture on the right here just shows what one of these uh, invasive algae look like. And then they form these dense pillows or these dense balls, if you will, at the bottom. And that second picture here on the left at the bottom just shows kind of what they look like. So assessing health requires a holistic approach, whether you're a lake or if you're a human, for example. If you go into the doctor for a checkup, you can't tell how health, healthy you are just by looking at one of these in indicators. So they often take your blood pressure and that tells you what your blood pressure is, but doesn't tell you how healthy a person you are. They have to look at other in, in, in indicators. They send you for a cholesterol test. They listen to your heart rate. They check your weight, your body temperature, your diet, your age, and so on. Same thing with lakes. Phosphorus loads and phosphorus concentration of attention, but that's only one or, or two in indicators that we use to, to figure out how healthy a lake is. So in total, we probably use around 350 to 400 in indicators, which we're looking at to try and track the health of Lake Simcoe. So in summary, Lake Simcoe, the overall phosphorus and oxygen concentrations in the lake have improved, but lows did not. And we need to understand why Lake Simcoe is going in this different direction from any other lake that we've studied. And why is there this disconnect between land and the lakes? We know that extreme rainfall events are driving up loads for the phosphorus loads. So we probably need to study how we can hold back all this water and, and try and better manage the lake in that respect. Invasive species, we need to understand what their role is. Lakes are complicated systems. In Lake Simcoe, there's probably over 10,000 diff different species. Each one of these species has countless genetic varieties. They're interacting with each other. They're interacting with the physical and the, chem and the chemical environment that they're in. And we can't just change one thing. We need to understand all these interactions as well. And this is one reason why we need targeted monitoring to find our answers and what's going on. So that's my talk and I'll stop sharing if people have questions or you can ask them later on <laughs> at the thank, discussions. Thank, thank you very much. That was very enlightening again. I mean, to me, um, we should be spending more time learning about the, the various conditions of the lake and what the pieces are that you were, that the diagram of the lake looking like a body is really important. I think that really speaks to what Vicky was talking about it, that, that it's life. And so, the life of that lake needs to be monitored in, in, in a lot of different ways. And, and thank you for doing that. But, but under present circumstances, given COVID and, and the amount of money and, and pressure we're putting on the healthcare system, are, are we neglecting some of this work that you, were, that you do? Or are you finding it harder to, to convince people to be able to do this work because the money, money has to go elsewhere? Uh, I think people are just as passionate about the lake as they have been in the past as well. I mean, there's a lot of active community and citizen science groups around the, the lake, which do a lot of great work as well. So um, from a personal perspective, I know COVID certainly impacted our uh, monitoring program. We were limited to how many people uh, were on the boat at any one time and how much we, we could get out. So we had to do like a reduced program. So hopefully okay. we're looking forward to when this pandemic <laughs> is done. We'll be 
back to normal capacity. So are you always looking for volunteers then through your work and, and to see if, if people had time to be able to help you do the studies? Uh, we, we can. We have had some student volunteers in the past as well. There's a lot of health and safety requirements too that's, that's involved with working on the boat. So. Okay. Um, we had a question here from Suzanne who said, uh, her question is, what type of fish is sustainable and healthy for eating in Lake Simcoe? Uh, there's lots of recreational important species. So lake trout, lake whitefish, lake herring, the cold water fish, they're all um, caught and consumed. Uh, perch, bass are, uh, are other ones as well. So uh, Ministry of Environment, I believe, or Natural Resources puts out a healthy fish guide sort of thing. So you can pick one of those up and it'll tell you how many fish of what species you can consume per, per year, per week kind of thing. So. That's great. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Brian. It was very interesting. And, and I think um, most people will have learned something more about the lake. Each time I hear, we seem to be adding layers to this whole uh, sense of understanding our watershed, which is our lifeboat, as we like to say. So, so we have time for one more speaker. And then what I want to do at the end is get everybody, if they want to, to share their own understanding of water. So just start thinking about what you might say if you if you want to spend some time chatting to us about what you feel about water. Um, but we have one more of our panelists here. Uh, Claire Malcolmson is the executive director of the Lake Simcoe Protection Coalition, which sounds like something we all need to belong to at some level and, and certainly donate to if we if you accept donations, and I'm pretty sure you do. So why don't you take it away and, uh, and lead us through your discussion of protecting our watershed? There I am, unmuted. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you're all tough acts to follow. I, I thank you so much to all of the speakers for um, the wisdom that you bring and the experience that you bring. Um, and thank you to the organizers for doing this in such a clever and inclusive way. And I think this is, um, yeah, this is filling my, filling my bucket, it's filling my heart. So uh, I hope I can keep you awake for the next 10 minutes or so. So it's uh, it always a challenge being the last speaker. So I'm the executive director of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition. Um, we started in 2003. We're a member-based organization. Uh, one of our member groups is the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, actually, just to tie it together. Um, and our big claim to fame is getting the Lake Simcoe Protection Act and plan. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about citizen activism and what it's got us and where we are right now. Um, in the, in the fight to save Lake Simcoe. Um, and I'm gonna start off by, by getting into what World Water Day asks us to do. And I think this is your, your question for the end really is, what does water mean to you? So I spent a little bit of time reflecting on this. Um, my, I, you don't need to think that this piece of art is nice. It's, it's, it's not, it's done by a five-year-old, but it's <laughs> really uh, one of those things that pulls my heartstrings. So these are my two boys uh, on the shore of Lake Simcoe in Innisfil. My family has had uh, family cottages there since 1889. And so for me, the lake is really uh, the, the home of my heart. Uh, it's the place that I have always felt uh, the most free. I mean, um, like a number of different people in different kinds of situations, you know, growing up with your cousins and your family and the aunts taking care of, you, of whoever's children happy to be there, that sort of community uh, is where I got my start. And um, we all care a lot about this property. We steward it. We have a, you know, arrangement with Ministry of Natural Resources to help protect uh, the forest and uh, the wetland. Some of my cousins had some kind of wetland nearby uh, identified and got Emma, the Ministry of Natural Resources to, to map it and to fully protect it. So there are an awful lot of really incredible people who come before me in my family. And one of the ways I try to give back is to carry on that legacy um, and, and protect Lake Simcoe, <laughs> really. Um, so for me, you know, that family history brings me to here. Uh, then I have two boys that are six and seven. And of course, uh, not only do I want 
Lake Simcoe to be healthy for them in the future, but for all of our children and for all of the world's children. I've traveled, I haven't ever traveled anywhere fancy, but I've traveled in Africa and Central America a lot. And so I have um, seen for sure, you know, what it, what it takes to be a water activist and how important water is and how serious this is and how universal. So again, just really appreciate everything people brought so far. A lot of it resonated with me. Um, so one of my children made this ridiculous uh, picture and I was like, what do you value about Lake Simcoe and draw, draw pictures of it. This I think is supposed to be Snake Island. Doesn't look anything like Snake Island. And there's a very happy fish. So, you know, for me, uh, water means, it means life, it means family, uh, it's, it's fun, but it's also purpose. For me, it's really a life purpose. Um, this is a picture from the cottage um, on Lake Simcoe, and now I've talked about it enough, so I'll go to my next slide. This is Cook's Bay looking east. So the Lake Simcoe watershed, <clears throat> I actually was not entirely clear that this was uh, a national um, screening here. So the, um, the Lake Simcoe watershed, as you can see here, has a number of sub watersheds. Uh, this is mapping done by the LSRCA, I believe, the, which Brian works for. Um, and they map the, the different areas that are sort of management units, but also their ecological units. This is actually really helpful for understanding your local area. Uh, something that we're starting to work on now, uh, education and outreach and that. So the Lake Simcoe watershed um, is just north of Toronto, Barrie, Aurelia. Uh, there are 500,000 people almost that live in the watershed already. This is the watershed. It goes all the way down to Southeast uh, Uxbridge. Um, so there are a lot of pressures on the lake, but there's also a lot of uh, good stuff that's happening. And as you can see, a really strong sustainable tourism uh, economy. And of course that sustainable tourism economy relies on a healthy uh, ecosystem and uh, a healthy ecosystem is healthy people and all the critters and birds and insects that rely on, on nature as well. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our, our activist history. So this is a, this is a very exciting event that I organized that was in 2007 at the South Shore Center in Barrie. Uh, when I started to organize this event and design the paper sitting on people's laps, this was, this was part of our campaign to get the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. Um, this was motivated by people's theory uh, that development was permitted on the shores at Moon Point in Oromodonte, a natural shore, and also at Big Bay Point. A lot of the people in this audience are from Big Bay Point. Uh, they did not think that permitting development in those places uh, should happen, and they were, like us, feeling that the lake needed stronger protections so that things like this wouldn't happen again. And so we brought a whole lot of people together uh, with environmental defense, who I was working for at the time, um, having had already a number of years volunteering on the board of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition. So Environmental Defense, Ontario Nature, and the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition campaigned together. And this is sort of our big event. Uh, I found out the morning of that the premier was coming. <laughs> That's why there are all these cameras. So then the premier of the time, Dalton McGinty, stands up and says, if I'm reelected, I will introduce the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. And so he was reelected and fast forward a year and many, many meetings later, um, here we are on the steps of Queens Park with the ladies of the lake, um, the minister at the time, Sarah Harmer sneaking in the background there um, and people from all of the organizations that, that we worked with, but only a handful because it's a very last minute the passage of the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. Really exciting. Uh, the next year, the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan came into effect. And the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, as Brian said, is really the, the watershed management uh, tool for the lake. So I just wanna pause here to, to point out, this was actually a citizen campaign. This was not an initiative of the Conservation Authority or the government. Uh, it, and this I think is a really important thing to recognize is that when there are problems and people can see them with their own eyes and they say, you may be telling me this thing, but what I see is my lake environment worsening and worsening 
then people are motivated to, to help out and do something. And I think that this was an incredible opportunity and a, an incredible example of that happening. So here's a list of some of my favorite things that, that we improved uh, with the introduction of the Lakes and Corporate Protection Plan. And I will just move on from there. So um, I went off, did other things, had some children, got married. Uh, I decided that I would re-enter and become the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition's first executive director in 2018 because the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan was supposed to be reviewed by law the next year in 2019. And I thought someone who knows it really well and cares should be there to run the campaign to protect the plan. And that's what I'm doing. Um, however, it didn't happen for two years uh, after that. So it's, it's just happened. It's just happening right now, actually. But um, as soon as the government changed uh, in Ontario, uh, the government of Ontario introduced Bill 66. So this was just there. This is the beginning of being an executive director was suddenly there's this terrible, terrible proposal for changing legislation that would have gutted really all the environmental uh, pieces of policy like Oak Ridge's Moraine, like Simcoe Plan, uh, Clean Water Act, it was insane. And we fought back incredibly hard with thousands of people across the province. It ruined the Christmas holiday completely, uh, but we won this campaign. So this was, this was the very exciting beginning for me of being an executive director for the first time. <clears throat> Uh, shortly thereafter, we started our Protect Our Plan campaign, and we and we decided very purposely to do that with uh, First Nations partners. We had a, a First Nations board member at the time, Becky Big Canoe from Georgino Island First Nation, and she had all sorts of great ideas, including bringing some um, well-known First Nations artists, Christy Belcourt and uh, Isaac Murdoch, to to come to the event and paint and sign art, and we sold that as well. Um, and so we brought together a whole lot of people. We pulled together a number of priorities for the review of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. And we thought we were all ready for the legislative review that was gonna happen that year. And then, we, and then we waited and we thought, well, that's okay because we still have lots of people to reach in time to do that in. So we had a really good volunteer year. This is pre-pandemic. We were setting up at booths all over the place. Some funky artists in, um, Fanti Bay decided they were going to yarn bomb hearts and they gave them to us to use as props. So we got a thousand people to sign our petition uh, for some you know, basic premises about how to improve the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan and met thousands of people uh, with a really heavy uh, outreach tour uh, the summer of 2019. We did some mapping, which I'll show you a little bit about, and we did a, uh, some community mapping sessions as well uh, to, to chart what, how well our green space is protected and also to get people's input about places that they value. Um, this was actually quite inspired by, uh, our first attempt at this was uh, with a group of First Nations people led by Carrie Ann Charles from Georgina Island First Nation uh, as the consultant on that part of the project. Um, and uh, it, was, it was really neat to do that, to start working on that piece first, actually, because we were able to see how bringing uh, a First Nations perspective on what is valuable on the landscape and what does water mean, that we wanted to, to get that into the sort of white Christian, uh, other the sort of dominant community in, uh, in the area around Lake Simcoe. So some, uh, some integration there. So here we are at the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan Review. Oh, this funky thing won't work. Anyway, Lake Simcoe Protection Plan Review is actually happening now, happening now in 2019. Um, so I'm going to go right ahead to kind of where it began. So the, the province of Ontario, um, sorry, the ministry that handles the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan is the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, the first thing the province did, really the first press release they had released about Lake Simcoe uh, was announcing some money and, but some money, not a lot of money, and uh, they released this, this report. Um, so Jeff York, the minister, wasn't even there. He got Andrea Kanjan, who's our local MPP, to present the minister's report. And uh, I was really not happy with this report, and it made me really worried because to me, it was presenting a handful of facts. Uh, I'm not questioning the science at 
all, nothing against any of the scientists. It's that in the lead up to the review of this significant legislation, the idea was that we were going to be able to see how well we were doing against the targets and objectives of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. And that was not at all done in a consistent way. I've now read a lot of staff reports on the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Uh, and that's echoed in a lot of those staff reports too. So I think when the province did that, I think municipalities maybe started to listen to us a little bit more that, uh, that we had some reason to be concerned that the province wasn't taking this as seriously as we would like them to, and that there was a lot at stake. Uh, you know, I'm one of the people that calls people out for um, using Lake Simcoe as a political pawn. You know, you can campaign on, I'm gonna save Lake Simcoe. Well, if you're not actually saving Lake Simcoe, then I'm a problem for you. And I'm the person that is gonna be saying, well, tell me how you're doing that. So that's a lot of, uh, the kind of work that we do at the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition is really trying to interpret for the public what government is doing and what we think they should be doing or what would be appropriate, uh, and then liaising with municipalities. Uh, they did, the province did a uh, public survey that's finished. It started really just before Christmas. Uh, and then they did a town hall and a science forum. Um, the town hall and the science forum really followed the same information that was in the minister's report. So the complaint remains, there isn't enough information really upon which to, to base any changes to the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Uh, so we're, we're campaigning not to change the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. We're saying these were our priorities. We're asking the province to leave the targets and objectives alone and focus on implementation. And actually that is an, that's been echoed by a lot of municipalities as well. Um, <clears throat> our priorities for the review, are, and these are really, these are some of the things that the lakes, that Lake Simcoe needs uh, in order to be healthy. So the first is about reducing phosphorus. Uh, Brian's talked about that. We are definitely out there saying development is a massive impact. It's the only growing impact of phosphorus pollution around the lake, and it remains a really big problem for Lake Simcoe. Um, we need better protected forests and wetlands. We need the Conservation Authority to have the powers that they had before December of this last year when the government of Ontario uh, gutted their powers uh, on permitting, which is a big problem across the province. And we're hoping that uh, the skilled negotiators at the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority can make sure that those powers are in place at Lake Simcoe. Um, because without the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority working on permitting applications and looking at a plan and saying, well, this doesn't meet the plan and you have to do this, that, or the other thing to reduce your phosphorus load, to reduce sediment runoff to the lake. If they can't do that, we're in serious trouble. So. That needs to happen. Uh, and also First Nations, um, you know, again, I, I have been on the, I was on the Lake Simcoe Coordinating Committee. I've been on all these provincial committees uh, with First Nations representatives as well um, since 2008. Um, and so the, speaking on behalf of the First Nations that were, I was in the meetings with, their feeling was that they did not get what was written in the plan, that they actually should have been consulted on creating some of the policies. Um, and they, they did not. And so we have a proposal out there for how to make good on the words in the, in the plan and not just, uh, not just say we're gonna consult, but actually do that uh, to good effect. Uh, stop the use of minister zoning orders because you don't have to apply the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Uh, that's another <laughs> insane policy change that's happened in Ontario recently. Uh, engage the public in restoration and invasive species control. And then, of course, also back to Brian's point about climate change. Uh, we really need to incorporate climate change policies into the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Um, we have a lot of municipalities that have supported our uh, petition or our resolution to uphold the targets and policies of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, where they refer to water quality and also to strengthen the policies that protect forests and wetlands in the watershed. Um, Brian showed you this chart. Um, I think I will show you this chart and then one more and, um, and then I'm gonna stop talking. I think we need to move on. So this represents some research that we did um, in 2019, looking at how well protected our natural features are. So 
what this map shows us is that 21% of the watershed is in what we're calling the best level of policy protection. So those are significant forests that are mapped and identified and labeled and protected by the province. Uh, they are also provincially significant wetlands. Uh, same thing. A lot of it's down here because the Oak Ridge's moraine has really strong forest protection policies, their core protected areas. But ironically, you know, it's right here where through the green belt, this is actually this whole east side of the Lake Simcoe watershed is in the green belt too. It's kind of, there's a proposal to put a highway here through uh, the green belt and through some of this highly protected land. So just to point out that even the land that's in the best protected category is not necessarily permanently protected. Uh, so we wanted to map it like this to make the case that unless we actually develop a natural heritage system that is protected and that is permanent, it's a death by a thousand cuts and we are gonna lose our natural heritage little bit by little bit by little bit, despite everybody's best efforts. So we really need to step it up on a policy level here in order to meet the natural heritage cover targets of the Lakes and Co-Protection Plan, uh, which are all about the lake's health. Um, the same map we did in Simcoe County, and there only 14% of the county is in that well protect, uh, that best protected category. My final slide um, is, so since 2018, honestly, it's been like playing whack-a-mole at Lake Simcoe. There is, I mean, there's a new resort marina proposed just down shore for me in Innisfil. I just got in a meeting about that last week. There are really a lot of pressures on Lake Simcoe right now, and there are far too many issues. I don't even work full time. Our organization has one full time staff equivalent, uh, three women that all work part time. So, you know, those of us who are working on this, we're like, this is nuts. We cannot keep up. We can't help all the groups that are reaching out to us and saying, what do we do? There's a new proposal for development. Um, so we're trying to make the case that Lake Simcoe is really under pressure in 2018, 2021. Uh, because of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan review, there's more attention paid to Lake Simcoe right now. But uh, here is just a, a list of things that if, I'm not going to go into all of them, but this is the list of issues that we're most concerned about uh, in Lake Simcoe right now. Um, happy to answer questions if people want. Here's maps of Bradford, uh, Bradford Bypass. I'm not going to go into it because we don't have enough time. But um, what I wanted to leave you with here is uh, we're a coalition. We are strength in numbers. So please go to our website, rescuelakesimco.org. And while you're there, you can go to the Take Action page and you can sign up for our e-newsletter. I only send out e-newsletters about once a month. Uh, really at the most, unless we're in a major, major campaign. And we really try to keep people up to date about what's happening. And then finally, we have a petition right here that's on our friends website, Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition, that has to do with the last slide, which was the, all the things that are happening on Lake Simcoe. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around and uh, for all of you for your devotion to the good things in life. It all makes a difference. And, uh, and I thank you for that. Well, thank you, Claire. On, on, on behalf of the, uh, the group here, on behalf of Simcoe County Kairos, wow. I mean, uh, this is uh, something that I I, I'm a political scientist, but I'm mostly a political philosopher. It's hard to philosophize about lakes, except to wax eloquent about their beauty and all this wonderful uh, interaction we have with it. But in, in, in this case, I think it's important to be political about this. And so it's really nice how the arc of the evening has gone from uh, the politics of First Nations and, and, the, and the politics of bringing together uh, various diverse communities to be able to talk about this very, very important resource that's right in front of us and we take for granted. And, and then end with, with uh, through, like weave it through us a, a beautiful rendition of, of how the Bible talks about water and how, and then and show how science fits. It all fits together. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, we really do have to be more political about all of this. And so, um, one of the th questions I have for you, if you don't mind, is I, I work at a university. I mean, universities are supposed to be serving the communities that they're 
sitting around. And so Lakehead University has a campus right on the, you know, right in Aurelia, uh, close enough to the water, certainly inside the watershed and certainly inside the, the protected areas of, of, of Simcoe County. Uh, York University is not that far away. Uh, Trent's not that far away. Are the universities at all involved in, in the research? And Brian, this is for you too, in, in doing research and connecting their students and, and programming to this area. Um, I can start with that. I mean, I, I was a part-time teacher at Georgian College uh, in 2008 and 2009. That was the time that I had the most amazing connection with students because I was their teacher. <laughs> Right. And they're like, oh, okay, we're going to, we're going to stick with you. Right. But I have gone into schools. I have spent a lot of time trying to engage students uh, through their teachers and by showing up and offering, um, here's something you can study. You can study this for credit. Da -da -da. It doesn't work. I'm sorry. I'm maybe I'm the wrong person, but uh, I'm a bit surprised at the, um, at, how unsuccessful I've been at that. And I, and I got to say, like, I think it is about relationships, mm -hmm. uh, but also, I mean, I don't know. I volunteered so much time to this kind of cause before I got a job. <laughs> I mean, anyway, I, I just, I was really surprised that students uh, did not volunteer more. I, um, and I, however, I, I, I have had really good luck with hiring interns. And so right. like, when you give somebody a job with a bit of money, uh, that's a different story and it's I've had really good luck with that um I'm open to ideas uh, I would wish it was better um but clues as to why it's not so I, I apologize for not mentioning George and of course George is a huge player in all of this as well so um Brian do you have any, anything to offer with that question I mean I you know you can just say no if you want <laughs> uh, yeah no um well uh, we have an education department that goes out and does um kind of student classroom activities, that sort of thing, about nature and Lake Simcoe and so on. Mm -hmm. um, at the post-secondary level, uh, yeah, George, Georgian College, uh, Lakehead University in Aurelia, there's a science group that has done some work on the lake. Uh, Trent University is one of our big partners as well. Um, I'm speaking tomorrow at the University of Toronto in Scarborough, for example, um, uh, with, with some researchers there that we've been working with, uh, York University, Ryerson University, University of Toronto. So there's lots of universities that have been doing uh, work on the lake as well and um, my main role is from a lake stewardship and management aspect so they can answer the questions that I really don't have the technology or the time to answer as well so right. they can delve into what can control a, a zebra mussel or what their life requirements are sort of thing that we just don't have time to do right well so it but so it really does take a coalition of force doesn't it it takes a coalition of people of science and working with first nations as well so I and, and, and all around it is, is this sort of spiritual essence of the lake, which is what we are. We are connected to all the water. So I thank all of you for your contribution tonight. And what we wanted to do at the end was just kind of go around the room, so to speak. So Claire, if you could stop sharing, we'll go back to, um, this is a method that I've used before. I don't know if you want to use it again, but you can try. What, what I would do is talk about my impression of the water um, and what water means to me. And then I would pick someone else and then they would pick, they would say something and then they would pick someone else and we, until we get hopefully through the entire group. We have about half an hour if you want to do that. If you don't, you can just listen as well. So I'm just going to start. I have very similar memories of water that, that uh, Claire talked about. I grew up uh, every summer at a cottage north of Montreal uh, that cottage is no longer in our family for political reasons and, and economic reasons more than anything. But um, it, is, uh, it is my fondest memories of water come from that and from that experience of being in and around the water and protecting everything around our property in the same way that you did. We were very much conscious in a, at a very early age of the importance of environmentalism, <laughs> but also of, of taking the time to clean up things, to make sure there we didn't dump things in the water. And so, uh, you know, I, I and, and my, uh, up until the last moment of her life, my mom was at the cottage and she, she died there at the cottage. So her spirit is always going to be at the, at that lake, no matter whether or not we own it or not, it's, it's always going to be there. So 
I've always had this spiritual connection to the lake and to water. And I, everywhere I go, there's water. As uh, I think it was uh, George who said, we have more water in Canada than any other place in the world. So we need to take care of it a lot more. So, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to give it over to my good friend, Elaine. Elaine Garrell, what do you think? Thank you, Doug. I grew up in uh, northern Saskatchewan, and that was uh, a religious experience for me, going camping and being by the water. Um, it's uh, marked me, as so many people have spoken about, the, the link between growing up and being by the water. It was that for me as well. Um, and I will uh, call on um, on uh, Becky. I don't think I have anything to add. Tom? Thank you, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> um, I want to talk about, well, I want to thank the four speakers. It was an excellent program tonight. I, I congratulate the, uh, the people that organized this. It was really first rate. Um, I want to talk about the hidden nature of water. And what I mean by that is that I'd like to uh, uh, help people increase their consciousness of watersheds. The, uh, the, Elaine had the, wonder, or we had the wonderful maps by uh, Claire of the watershed, the Lake Simcoe watershed. And it's, it, it's bigger than Lake Simcoe. And I think people have a problem with this because they think it's just Lake Simcoe, but it's not, it's the entire watershed. And uh, I just love maps. And frankly, we don't, the consciousness of the watersheds is not in our heads the way uh, road maps are or any other kind of maps. But I think this is what we have to develop is a consciousness of the watershed that we're in. And I'd love to see maps such as, uh, that, that I saw that Claire produced in many public places like public libraries and, and municipal, uh, municipal offices, etc. We need to have our consciousness raised about the watershed that we're living in. And I don't think it would take that much. Well, Doug, you're a political scientist. Maybe I see it very politically. I see watersheds as a very political issue. But if you, you have, you've got to frame it in that sort of way, because until we do have that consciousness, the Ford the, the four type of governments in this country are going to ride roughshod over us all, all the time, all the time, all the time, because people haven't got it in their heads that we're part of a watershed. Anyway, that's all I want to say about that. But thank you very much for this wonderful evening. So now pass it somewhere else. Oh, I'll, I'll pass it on to Dave Gordon. As Tom was saying, the, the watershed... It goes back to our first peoples because that really defined the, the territorial because of the transportation networks of where uh, they survived and thrived. So uh, it has a historic as well as a, a geological uh, meaning. And uh, I think like f for us, uh, uh, you know, we might be on the moraine, but we have to think of which way on that ridge line the water flows, and that's what connects us. I would like to invite Suzanne. Thank you for all the learning tonight. I, I just feel enriched by all the different presentations. And water for me, much has already been said from Elaine and other people, and, uh, is it Tom? the host about um, growing up around water. We have a family cottage that's still in the family and swimming. I mean, we drink water, we swim in water, we look at water. I live near Camp and Felt Bay and I walk there as much as I can. I love it, but it feels like it's always there. It feels like it's a perpetual thing, but I know not to take it for granted. It's, it's sacred to me, it's important. We drink it, yeah, we need it, we live it, our bodies are water. I think kids are learning about the water cycle too and, and the science of it. But as, as uh, was it Tom who said, maybe we need more education around us to remind us all the time about the value of water. So thank you for that. And I'll pass it to, I'll have to see who else is the names all here. Um, I can't see all the, the names, sorry. Just. Uh, 
pass it to Muriel. Is Muriel there? Or Valerie? Muriel's not there. Yeah, I'm there. I'm here. <laughs> uh, just basically, thank you very much for the, the, the four different perspectives on water. I really found that uh, broadened my whole perspective. Um, all of them uh, so informative and <laughs> so helpful. Um, basically, that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. And the whole watershed, I do a lot of hiking. The whole watershed is always a conversation because I hike a lot on the Oak Ridge Moraine. So I was with a, a friend about um, the, a month ago while we were in, on snowshoes on one of the highest points and figuring out, okay, exactly what point on this moraine does the water flow south to the Humber system and north to the Holland. And um, then of course we went home and looked at our maps and I think both of us came up with the conclusion, these there are vast numbers of tributaries and rivers that we weren't aware of until we walked there and then also looked at the maps. So that's just from a personal perspective recently, but um, thank you again. I just found it extremely informative. And the whole, and particular, the one that I, um, the indigenous perspective and the Christian perspective to weave that into the others was uh, valuable to me. Thank you. So Muriel, you pick someone now, and someone's actually requested Vicky to speak too. I don't know if you want to ask Vicky. Okay, Vicky, Vicky. Uh, miigwech, Muriel. Uh, miigwech to everybody who's spoken already uh, this evening, and miigwech to the wonderful speakers. Miigwech, Doug, for uh, this uh, this uh, for moderating so uh, eloquently. Um, I guess what I want to say about water is that when I was a kid, I'm not going to give you my whole life story, so we're not going there. But when I was a kid, I used to jump off the Indian Maiden, like right oh, off geez. the top, right <laughs> off the cabin. And we used to actually have, um, we used to, we weren't allowed to do it. And sometimes they would send the police down when they would see all the Nish little Nishnabe kids jumping off the uh, cabin of the Indian Maiden. But, uh, and I, I would jump down and, and I think it was about maybe, uh, maybe 10 to 14 feet of water, depending on what year it was or whatever, because of the water would rise and fall. And um, anyways, uh, I would hit the water and then I would just sink right down to the bottom and I would hit the ground uh, underneath the water and then I would come back up. And I really think that that kind of fearlessness is what we need for water today. Uh, we need to be able to take risks. We need to be able to get out of our comfort zones. We need to be able to have that uh, youthful attitude towards water and to push ourselves to do things that we wouldn't normally do. And as a child, I was fearless and I could do those kinds of things. Now I, now I would think twice about jumping off the Indian Maiden, but you know, my kids have done it a couple of times and been caught by police, but <laughs> um that 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 is the best memory and I think growing up on Chimina Singh every kid had, every kid did it so <laughs> I'm gonna leave it there because... Brian why don't you share your personal story maybe I mean you've talked about a science perspective but maybe you know what do you think of it like when you're out there do you connect with the water you must uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the more you know about water, the more you appreciate of it. I mean, I grew up um, on the East Coast, so I grew up around water, both the ocean and I had family that had cottages on lakes and so on. So I grew up kind of turning over rocks, looking at different things. And then you get into high school and university and find out you can actually have, 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 have a career doing something that you find is fun kind of thing. So. And the more you learn about water, the more you learn how magical it is, like the angle of the atoms determine the properties of water, what it can and can't do. And it's one of the only substances that its highest density is at four degrees Celsius. So ice, so its solid state is less dense than it is at its liquid state. So I mean, it's just 
fascinating. <laughs> and, and, and we're spending billions of dollars to try and figure out if there was water on Mars right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I think sometimes I think, well, why couldn't we spend those billions of dollars protecting the water that we have here? Because I don't plan to go to Mars anytime <laughs> soon. Um, you know what I mean? I think we, we really have our priorities mixed up. And in some ways, leaving the Earth is is problematic to me. Why why would we want to leave this beautiful planet? It's incredible. And anyway, that's another story. Thank you, Brian. Um, did you want to pick someone else too? Uh, no, I'll let you. You know the crowd here, so you can. <laughs> well, I don't know the crowd. Sonia hasn't said anything, and I know Sonia can say something. So, how about you, Sonia? There. Okay. Um, thank you again so much for this evening. It was just wonderful. And I only wish I'd had this information last week because I had been asked to uh, prepare a sermon for two different churches this past Sunday and focusing on uh, today being Water Day. Mm. So that sent me scurrying in a number of different directions. And thanks to Elaine and also to George, I spoke with both or was in touch with both of them. But for me, water has always been a sacred place. Um, it's where I feel the closest to God. And in my research last week, um, there was a meditation that actually appeared uh, March the 15th. So that would have been probably Monday or Tuesday last week. And it was from a meditation called Lutheran's uh, Connect. And this Sherry Coleman writes it. And what she had said, and you know, I'll just always remember this. For me, it was very powerful. Water is the connective essence. So the soul or spirit of all of creation. And I just thought, wow, that says it just in a few short words. So uh, water is very important to me and the care of it and uh, being able to take part on the water and to remember always that the physical and spiritual parts of water are always intertwined. You can't separate them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, George, how about you? You must have something more personal. George grew up in a place called Smooth Rock Falls. Have you ever been to anyone ever been to Smooth Rock Falls? It just sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It sounds like a Stephen King, you know, kind of what's the uh, that one uh, Stand by Me kind of place where people grew up with with other kids and stuff. How was that, George? You're you're muted right now too. Smooth Rock is a. a, a was a paper town. Um, there isn't a mill anymore. The town is still there on the Metogamy River uh, north of Timmins. And uh, below the dam were huge sturgeon, just gigantic fish uh, down there. Um, it was quite something. But now I live uh, just one street back from Kempenfelt Bay. We can see the bay from our windows here. Uh, there's one street between us and the bay. We swim in it. We canoe on it. Uh, this winter, we walked on it. And uh, this summer, we're going to start sailing on it. Um, water for me is, is just the most magic, incredible, indescribable um, medium um, for uh, recharging my spiritual batteries or calming me down when, when I need that. But it seems to me that people can't protect or appreciate or love or feel connected to something that they haven't experienced. Mm. I, I think we, we need to have some kind of encounter <laughs> session, you know, for our youth, bring them to the water, um, help them to experience what it's like to be around the water. Um, up around Sturgeon Falls, uh, one summer I was uh, laying on, on the rocks um, after uh, nightfall and little tiny waves were coming up on the shore and there were all pebbles along the shore and, and the water was chuckling among the pebbles. And this last summer, um, we had a family gathering uh, distanced and we went to a long distance too. We went to Pancake Bay and along the water mm -hmm. there, you see pebbles with the most phenomenal colors, mm -hmm. but you only see the colors are in the when they're in the water. When you take them out and you dry them, they just get dull. 
you know, so the water reveals something there that the air can't. So I think there's a lot of, of ways that we could help people experience water so that they could treasure it more. Thanks, George. That's wonderful. Um, so it's who else is out there? Matt Stevens. Are you going to say something, Matt? Can I say something? Oh, of course, Rainer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, who's is that? Is Matt still there? Yeah, this oh. is me. So Matt, why don't you go and then Rainer right after? How's that? Okay. Oh, bojo, anem kis deshne kars makogi nin dorem shonyan inu adash wawa si azigaga nin deu nin juba. Kagi apane ne nukumisan shumsinan kui in web what wawa si azigaga nin uma. Greetings, my relatives. My name is uh, Little Thunder of the Bear Clan. I come from Georgian Island. I also said to you that I said to you the true name of this place that we're talking about. It's the Shining Lake. Mm-hmm. Long before Lord Simcoe decided to name that lake after himself. It's for 10,000 plus years that we know of that uh, we've lived on this place. We've called this place the Sacred Lake Home. Mm-hmm. And I was even looking at the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, it says for 200 years, you know, human influences, um, human in- activities that have influenced the Lake Simcoe watershed, if you will. Um, in a way, it's, uh, it's, there's two meanings behind that, you know. It still denotes that notion that there was nothing here before colonialism showed up um and it also acknowledges the the severe impact that that's had it's very misleading because if you go to the top end of this lake in Oma, to that water fence that predates the pyramids in egypt so for you to say that there's human activities have only influenced lake simcoe for the last 200 years that's very uh, it's, a, it's a half truth and always it only the impacts on one aspect of what that is you see the difference is is the Anishinaabe Anishinaabe Adzuin the Anishinaabe way we we have a responsibility to Baba Madzuin to life to promote good life so we as human beings are only one small piece of this puzzle and so our actions of our ancestors we never left uh that impact that we as humans now seem to leave everywhere, myself included, you know, the life that I live now, you know, I have to take, jump in my car and drive to the, to my place of employment. And, you know, what does that do to the air? What does the Tim Hortons cups that I throw in the garbage, what does that do to Akikwe? What does it do to the earth? You know, I have a toilet the same as you. We actively defecate into that, which gives us life. And I think there was a speaker who said it earlier, you know, why are we investing all this money to go look, to Mars for water. Well, the, the key to that is because whether people want to consciously admit it or not, we understand that water is life. So that in the pursuit of looking for life in the cosmos, that is what they're looking for is water. And so it's, it's encouraging to me to listen to this talk, to see the different perspectives and to know that there's people out there that care. The question that I ask is, where is this coming from? Um, we as human, human beings, we seem to forget our responsibility as caretakers, as stewards of life. We seem to still be approaching everything from our human perspective, whether that's a need to pr- protect our places of leisure, whether that's the government's need to protect its policy and its economic machine, if you will. It always comes from a human perspective. You know, um, no one really is taking into account, you know, that which does not exist anymore. You know, on uh, on Dioma, you know, Olga, you know, where are all those pickerel? Where are those lake trout? We listen to the elders. I can tell you that, you know, I'm no scientist, so I'm not going to be able to tell you scientifically what's happening. But I could tell you the difference. I'm 35 years old, so I can tell you what Lake Simcoe looks like now compared to when I was a little boy. I can tell you that we don't, we can't go swimming anymore because 
we're dealing with what is that swimmer's itch you know i can tell you what the fish look like when i pull them up out of the water i can tell you what the sport fishermen you know dwell on that term for a second what they do to the lake and the garbage that they leave everywhere you know so it's i totally agree with what some of the speakers said earlier is that we need to raise um the political pressure if you will we need to one of my colleagues at work you know it's important to create this critical mass so we all have to come together and work to protect that which gives us life whatever our viewpoints whatever our, our faith whatever wherever we're coming at it, even if we are coming at it from somewhat of a selfish human needs if you will the point is is we still have to do this work together you know we as Anishinaabe people you know your cottages, your cottages were laid. The foundation for those cottages were laid after we were displaced from our territory, after we were unable to do our job as stewards of this land. You know, it was only in like that, like that Lake Simcoe Protection Plan says, you know, in the last 200 years, things have been decimated. Like, if you understood the spirit of this lake, if you understood what this really meant, if you understood what this actually did for all of our common history, you know, I'm we won't even worry about the ancient Anishinaabe. We'll worry about the founding of, of this state. You know, we'll worry about the last few hundred years. Where do you, where do you determine the wealth needed to build a country? Where did it come from? Where did the timber come from? It came from Southern Ontario. Where did the water that was used for the ice boxes all over North America, you know, it came directly from Lake Simcoe commercial fishing and commercial fishing boats were, everywhere in the early 20th century harvesting up that that pickerel thousand tens of thousands of pounds being shipped out so we as human beings are like a machine you know the the imperial way is to come in and claim ownership of something bend it to your will use the resources as you see fit and there's never any um there's never any empathy if you will for anything else you know, we don't, and that's where we're coming from. As Nishabe people, I can tell you that it's hardwired into us. It's hardwired into our spirit that that's what cripples us is because my spirit still remembers the cranberry marsh. It still remembers the wild rice. It still remembers the water fence. It still remembers the sacred places around this lake. And when I said that and I introduced myself, what I said is forever, you know, dwell on that term for a second but our grandparents are literally buried everywhere you know our great chief is buried under a sidewalk in Aurelia that Huron village is being you know torn up for the go train so once again we as humans need to reevaluate like how we're going how what we're really doing you know why are we protecting water we're protecting it now because it's become threatening to us we're not protecting water out of a place of compassion for the all life that, that requires that, you know? So I don't know. It's uh, I'm willing to help in whatever ways you want. Um, you know, I can help build awareness through, through my job and through my work. But once again, it, I agree with some of what was said, you know, it falls on deaf ears. I know, I know what happens when I go to site 41. I know what happens when I get pushed off of my own territory for recreational purposes right so i apologize if some of this seems uh harsh or rough but that's the simple reality of what we face you know our our lake is under threat and it continues to be and there's no people aren't the development isn't stopping in york region isn't stopping in simcoe region the subdivisions are going up all over the place you know so what, what's going to end up happening? I don't know. So I hope we can figure this out. No, I'll miss you all today. Oh, I'm done. Thank you, Matt. It's 8.59. Reiner, did you want to say something or, yeah? Very briefly, <clears throat> I came to Canada in 1965. Ten years later, we went to a tiny township and looked around Georgian, southern Georgian Bay and we liked what we saw, including the beautiful sunsets. So in 74, we had built a house up on a hill overlooking Torchon Bay. 
And uh, we lived there for 30 years and we planted a few thousand trees in the process because we were living on sand, on genuine soft Georgian Bay sand. But as far as water is concerned, I would like to congratulate Vicky Monac about their efforts with Site 41. I was there at the time and we too had a sign on front of our house or down uh, the road saying protect our water. And we were on a water well, a drilled well, 85 feet down. And it was the best water that you could ever imagine. And now that we live in Barrie, we miss that good water very much. Thank you for a beautiful evening. Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, the Zoom gods are going to start push, shutting us down soon enough. So let's, let's say thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody that was here tonight. I, I, I now know more people than I did before this evening started. So thank you again to all our speakers and uh, keep doing the wonderful work that you do.